Welcome back everybody, Phil here with another video. So in my previous video on my AI journey, I got a question on whether or not one should do an AI startup. I thought I would give my thoughts on that, but first, if you are new to the channel, I am Dr. Phil Tabor. I got my PhD in condensed matter physics in 2012 and promptly went to work for Intel Corporation as a back-end dry edge process engineer. I left there in 2015 to pursue my own interests and have been doing consulting, freelancing, contract work ever since. So. Let's go ahead and talk about the concept of an AI startup. Now, first of all, I really don't like this word startup to begin with. It implies something that it is really not. So it implies in general a sort of grandiose, you know, look at me with my startup bro kind of thing. And I don't really care much for that. I'm a little bit older. I turned 38 in a couple of weeks. So I have a slightly different perspective on how business should operate. I'm a little bit more old school in that sense. And I don't think that startup is a very good word. The phrasing I would use to describe what it is you, you actually want to do is a software as a service company that perhaps uses artificial intelligence to solve the customer's problem. Now, my language here kind of betrays my true uh, thoughts in the matter. Uh, what I mean by that is that many so-called startups in the modern era rely on uh, perpetual investor funding to con to ensure their continued survival. So companies like WeWork, Uber, burn through cash like it's going out of style, uh, and they don't really generate an operating profit. The philosophy there being that they are sacrificing profitability for market growth, right? They lose money in every sale, but they're going to make it up in volume over time, right? Uh, and I don't think this is a sustainable business model for the average person. If you are someone with significant connections, you're probably not watching me, uh, first of all. But if you are someone with significant connections, then perhaps it can work. However, in a more long-term point of view, that is not a sustainable business model. Why does it work now? It works now because there is a huge amount of hype. Uh, money is cheap. This is a kind of a global macroeconomic condition where some countries even have negative interest rates. Here in the States, we've had you know, single digit, low single digit interest rates for the past decade or so. And that is truly an aberration on the historical timeline that won't last forever. And when that uh, situation ends, so will the easy investor funding. And so the companies that rely on easy money are going to go under and just be a, a kind of a, a historical side note in history. So what does work in the long run? What works in the long run is building a company that uses software to solve the problem for the customer. Now, if you can use artificial intelligence to do so, and if it makes you more profitable, if it makes you more efficient, then that is awesome and you should definitely do that. However, if you can do it with uh, just dumb means without artificial intelligence, then by all means do so, right? There, pretty much every software company to date doesn't really rely on AI with a few exceptions, of course, you know, things like Facebook, Google, but the vast majority do not rely on artificial intelligence and have been totally wildly profitable, more money than you or I could ever really want. And so there is, you know, no real need to introduce artificial intelligence uh, aside from attracting investor funding because that is a marketing bullet point uh, if you can solve the problem with using more traditional software technologies. So how would you even go about creating your own software as a service startup? Now, full disclaimer, I do not have my own. However, I have consulted for companies that are SaaS businesses, and I have talked to people who have their own. You know, I'm in a community of entrepreneurs, which by the way, uh, if I'm gonna make a couple book recommendations uh, as well as an associated forum. If you are interested in entrepreneurship, you should check out the book Unscripted by MJ DeMarco, as well as his original book, kind of a cheesy title, but it's called The Millionaire Fast Lane. Uh, but in those two books, he lays out a framework for evaluating businesses that have the capacity to scale quickly to achieve relatively quick wealth. You know, there's no get rich quick scheme, but you can achieve wealth in a period of, you know, five to 10 years. And that can, and those uh, conditions are laid out in those two books. I'll go ahead and leave a link to Amazon. These are not affiliate links. I don't get paid when you click on them, uh, but I do wholeheartedly recommend the books. I have them, but they are currently on loan to a friend who is out of the country in India. And of course I, you know, decided to make the video now, but check out those two books. And there's an associated forum, uh, the Fastlane forum, where I'm a frequent poster uh, under the name Low Tech. You can check me out there, but it's a, uh, a free forum. You don't have to pay anything. Uh, and it's kind of a support group for entrepreneurs, people that want to uh, create, you know, uh, solid businesses and scale them as quickly as possible. So all of that plugging aside, uh, the there are some fundamental steps that you should take to start a business. So in the books that I mentioned, they lay out a framework. It's called the Sense, C-E-N-T-S. It's a series of five requirements for a business that you should adhere to. These are MJ's ideas. I'm just parroting them from the book. You know, these aren't my own. Uh, but if you 
think about this framework within the context of your favorite companies, you'll see that pretty much it is spot on and it will give you a handy framework for thinking about how to start your own business. So C stands for control. You have to be able to control all aspects of the business from the pricing to the distribution to pretty much everything. The more control you have over the company, the better. So that's why things like multi-level marketing, AKA pyramid schemes, uh, among other reasons, but pr predominantly control really fail the test for a fast lane business because you have no control over the pricing of anything. You have no control over anything in the business. Uh, and so you, you know, if the pricing of something changes, you have no control over that. And it's not really a solid business to engage in. E stands for entry barriers to entry. It should be difficult enough that other people can't easily follow you, follow you in. If other people see you making a profit, they will follow you into the marketplace. That is a certainty, but it should not be easy for them to do so. It should have some significant barrier to be overcome. And AI companies in particular do fit the bill for this because it is exceptionally difficult to get data, to massage data, to, do, to train models and to deploy them in the real world. So AI companies, AI startups certainly have the barrier to entry down. N stands for need. It must solve a need in the marketplace. Nobody gives a crap about your passion. You know, if your passion is sitting around smoking weed, playing video games all day, nobody cares about that. They're probably not going to pay you to do it. But if you have a cure for cancer, people are certainly going to need that. They're certainly going to pay money, almost any amount of money for that. And you'd be fantastically wealthy. This is the most fundamental of commandments, the need, uh, the need commandment, because without a market need, there's nobody going to give you any money for what it is that you're trying to offer. The next commandment is time. So you must be able to divorce your time for money. This is why freelancing, contracting, consulting doesn't really cut it as a fast lane business model. You can only work so many hours in a day. And if your uh, earnings are capped by the amount of time you can work, then your earnings are ultimately capped. So you must be able to separate time for money. Now, software as a service companies certainly fit the bill because customers can pay money. They can use the platform at any point in time and your labor is not required. And finally, S stands for scale. So you must be able to scale beyond just you. If you are the linchpin of the company, then it is not gonna function, right? It is gonna fall apart in your absence and you'll never be able to take a vacation. You have basically engineered yourself a job, which you can make a good amount of money doing so, right? If you're making $1,000 an hour, let's say, as a consultant, uh, then you can certainly stack money very quickly. But the moment you stop working, then you know, you're basically screwed. You have to be able to scale the business to include more people, more systems, so that it doesn't require you as input and it is able to grow beyond you. So let's say you've evaluated a business and you think it meets all of these requirements and you want to know how to test it. Well, most developers, uh, will do the backward approach. They will build the whole thing, they will launch it, and then there will be nothing but crickets and they'll wonder what the hell went wrong. Well, this is a totally backward approach. Uh, if you notice, many businesses actually start by taking pre-orders. They start by setting up a landing page, which is a very simple web page with an email capture, uh, you know, some good copy to let the people know what the point of the product is, what problem it will solve, why it will benefit them, why they should give you their email address, right? Because if you can't get an email address, you certainly cannot get a credit card number. Uh, that's just a fundamental fact of human nature. If someone doesn't trust you enough to give you an email, they're not gonna give you a credit card number. So the webpage should convey the point of the product, uh, when it is launching, what it's gonna do for them, and uh, capture their email. And so then you spend a little bit of money on ads, you know, $1,000 or something like that to run traffic to it using something like Facebook. Uh, Google ads works, although here in the States, it's, it can be incredibly expensive, something like a dollar a click. So you're not going to get, uh, and more if you're running, depending on how profitable the keyword is. So you're not going to have the, uh, on AdWords, you wouldn't have the opportunity to run a significant volume of traffic, but whatever traffic avenue you come up with, drive traffic to the website, see how many signups you get. If you send a thousand people to the website and only get like five or 10 email signups, either the landing page is terrible and doesn't convey the you know benefits of the product enough or the idea itself isn't good enough. So uh, one way to know to differentiate is if nobody else is doing the idea, it, there may be a good reason behind it. So it's pretty rare that you or I are gonna have an original idea, right? Anything you can think of has already been thought of and is probably already in practice. So the way to differentiate is if there's already a company doing the certain thing that you think should be done, then by all means, this is a great idea because you know somebody else is already making money doing it. People think that if they see someone else doing what it is they wanna do, that they can't do it because hey, it's already been done. But that's totally backward thinking. 
uh, the mere fact that someone else is doing it tells you it's profitable, it can be done, and it probably should be done. Now, of course, you can't just copy. You have to come up with your own value skew. You have to do something better, maybe better customer service, better user experience, better overall product, better price. You know, whatever way you can add value to the customer is fine, but the differentiating factor uh, between the two cases of a crappy landing page or crappy idea is, is somebody else already doing it. Now, of course, uh, if you're like me, you have no design talent whatsoever, and you should get a professional to design your landing page, someone that knows how uh, user design, uh, user interaction, user experience works. I know nothing about it, so I don't, you know, I would uh, probably outsource that or make a rough sketch, a rough layout, and then have someone else improve it. Uh, but either way, basic idea is you set up a landing page conveying the value behind the product, drive traffic to it, and attempt to capture emails. So then let's assume you've gotten a whole bunch of emails. What do you do then? Well, you set up an email list and you email everybody and say, hey, thanks for your interest. Uh, product is coming soon. Then you set to work for the next 30 days or whatever, however long it takes, and furiously work on that product. Only, uh, only focus on that, throw everything else aside, and focus on that idea and get it to launch as quickly as possible. Now, the main temptation here is going to be feature creep. You're going to want to include everything right out of the gate. Uh, and that's going to be a mistake. You should have one function and it should be, it doesn't even have to be pretty. The website doesn't have to be beautiful. It just has to be totally and completely functional. It has to work the first time every time. So focus on getting a single core feature to market with as much speed as possible. Then when the product is ready, you email the list, say, hey, product is live. Thank you for your support and send everybody to the page and see how many people buy it. And what you're going to find is that you know, just because people gave you their email, they may not really be interested. You're not going to get everybody on the list to sign up and buy the, the product, but you will get some. And if you get a few people, if you get 10 people that are totally unaffiliated to you, if you get 10 people that don't know you uh, to buy your product, then you have a business. You're on to something and you should definitely pursue that. And uh, from there, there's a number of ways of thinking about how to scale it. Uh, you can break it down into some simple mathematics. You know, if you want to make a million dollars, you can sell a thousand dollar product a thousand times. You can sell a hundred dollar product, you know, 10,000 times and so on and so forth. So that guides your thinking towards, you know, uh, how, how to price the product as well as the number of customers you need to acquire. Some key metrics for you to look at is what is the cost of acquisition? So if you're... If your product is going to generate, let's say people sign up for your software for six months, say it's 50 bucks a month, $300. So you know the lifetime value of a customer is $300. If you can acquire customers for less than $300, then you've made a profit. Of course, the less amount it takes to acquire them, the better. In general, uh, at least two to one, right? If it's costing you more than $150 to acquire a customer, you need to trim something from your operation. You need to figure out where you're wasting uh, because you're going to have other costs associated with the business. You're going to have compliance. If, if you have employees, you're going to have HR. You're going to have contractor costs. You're going to have taxes, uh, which are innumerable. You're going to have accounting fees. You're going to have legal fees for incorporation, uh, all kinds of things. So at least two to one and as high as you can possibly get it is going to be the best possible ratio. So those are my thoughts on the whole startup thing. You notice that AI didn't really play a huge role in it, and that's because uh, AI is a sort of buzzword. There's no true artificial intelligence. You know, deep learning is cool. It solves some problems. Uh, and if you can use it to solve a problem in a more effective way that allows you to deliver more value to the customer, then by all means do so. Build that business. Get that money. You know, make your mark on the world. That is an awesome thing to do, and I salute you for that. However, if you can do it with regular software, you know, dumb means, then by all means do so because you can still make a good living doing that. You can still make a whole boatload of money doing that, and you can still solve you know, uh, significant problems in the marketplace, which is really what it's all about. Don't rely on investor funding because that can go the way of the dodo very, very quickly without warning. You know, things will collapse. If they collapse, would collapse quite quickly. And then that investor funding dries up and then you've got to lay people off. Uh, you've got a bit of egg on your face and you won't have developed the muscle, the muscle memory to actually go into a marketplace and compete with companies that are already providing value to customers rather than pitching to investors. So I hope that was helpful. These are my thoughts, things I've observed from other companies, things I've observed from watching other people build companies, launch products, uh, as well as things I've read in a book. Uh, of course, my own experience is with uh, running YouTube channels, selling courses to people. I've sold my AdWord services. I have uh, run paid traffic before, uh, and I've got a fair amount of experience helping other people sell their products using paid traffic. So I know a little bit about this stuff, uh, not all aspects of it, but at least some portions of it. So some of this comes from personal experience, other, other portions from others' experiences. 
but take it for whatever it's worth. I'll link in the description to the books I recommended as well as another series of blog posts that I forgot to mention, but basically detail this process in a written form. So be sure to check that out. Any questions, comments, leave them down below. Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon because I know only 14% of you are getting my notifications and I'll see you in the next video.